Wow, it's working. All right. Here we are. First day back. Why does it feel like I haven't done this forever? All right. So let's see. We covered all the stuff I think we had to cover earlier. The syllabus, Canvas, time cards. Uh, AMTP 200. Uh, so Saturday class. With this particular class, you got to watch it because you can't show up on Saturday class if your teammates don't do a bunch of stuff on the engine. So keep that in mind. Everybody has to stick together. I think I mentioned that maybe in lab that that was my hope that everybody would kind of be doing the same thing, at least at this point. We get down to measuring, you can go off and do your own thing. Uh, let's see. What is an A quality? Highest standards, parts are well cared for on the engine. You're not dropping stuff. That's a big deal. Losing things, um, no breakages, over under torques, good corrosion prevention, follow directions. When you're all done with this, you are going to be doing a log entry in the back of your that, the log book about what you did. Uh, so keep that in mind as you do stuff. Take notes. Let me see. Directions from, uh, above and beyond just a get it done project. You are going to run it, and your name is going to go in a log book. If you got, did you guys look and see who the last group who did your engine was? Name's going to go there. There's right outside the classroom. So if there's any problems, I just walk right out there and grab them and go, hey, hmm. says you guys are the last ones to work on this. Your name's going in it, and I'll know where to find you next year. Um, let's see. Uh, good use of time, cleanliness, proper use of manuals. That's going to become more important as you start putting it back together. Um, although I'll probably continue to work with you, we're going to open up the manuals and look it up and follow it step by step. Because no matter how many of these engines I put together, I never, ever did it without the manual open into the page I was doing. I knew exactly what the book was going to say to do next. There was no doubt in my mind, but I still opened it up, went to that page, did the, read it, because you're just reading a small paragraph, then you do it and come back, read the paragraph. I did it, I did it, check, next one. So, when you're working on engines, it's not a, not a lot of stuff that's very forgivable when you make a mistake. It tends to show itself up later in the most inopportune times. Like when your customers IFR at night over the mountains. So, not to mention it sucks when you're laying awake in bed at night going, did I tighten all those uh, jam nuts on the rocker arms? I'm sure I did. Well, whoever did that engine that you guys were working on that did it. We should back look that up. That was Patrick. Yeah, was That's your engine? Uh, tomorrow we got to look up that. Go ask him. Hey, you guys know you did that? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I get that there. All right, so we are working on a Lycoming 0290 engine. Let's talk about the 0290. O290. All right, this is coming off of the TCDS. Who knows what the TCDS is? Type certificate data sheet. So there are three things that have a type certificate data sheet, airframes or airplanes, engines and propellers. So a type certificate data sheet is going to give me a certain amount of information. Let's see if this gives me the information I want. Oh, yeah, they moved it, and I thought so. Um, back to here. So I've just pulled the excerpts of what I wanted to look at here. So it's going to tell me certain information. So when it was manufactured and the FAA issued it a type certificate saying this is an aircraft engine, it came in basically three versions here. Oops, the D, the D2, or the D2A, which is very similar. Uh, the Delta II Bravo and the Delta II Charlie. And you can see that the type certificate number is all the same. Takeoff horsepower, we're working with the smaller one, the 130. Takeoff RPM, 2800. So these are all the things that you're going to find in your type certificate data sheet. Let's see. What's the maximum RPM? 2800. That'd be its red line. Rated RPM 2600, you can go over that. There'll be some notes and stuff on how to use that. Let's see, displacement 289, which is almost 
290, got a compression ratio of 6.5 to 1 on that engine. 1 to 1 ratio drive. Uh, let's see, oops, I keep doing that. Firing order, 1, 3, 2, 4. All four cylinders of that. And the spark occurs at... 25 degrees before top dead center. Also has valve rocker clearance. So those are some of the things we can note from there. Let's see what else we can talk about it. Uh, TBO, what does TBO stand for? Time between, Time between overhaul, which is to say that when the manufacturer made it, they said, okay, this engine, if it's maintained properly and flown regularly and on and on and on, should last up to 2,000 hours, or if it's D2, 1,500 hours. Or every 12 years. 12 years. Nobody ever follows that 12-year thing. What's that? That's insane. That's insane. Yeah, nobody, nobody follows that. Uh, difference between the models. Let's see, the D has solid tappets, hydraulic control valve. The 29011 is the same, same thing. They just changed the designators. Um, although it does have a horsepower change, which is funny. Uh, D2 has got hydraulic tappets. D2A, uh, same hydraulic tappets, hydraulic tappets, hydraulic tappets. That's a big deal right there. One engine has solid, the other one has hydraulic. So we have the D, which has solid tappets, which when we take the engine apart, we'll talk a little bit later too about tappets. <coughs> the camshaft pushes on the tappets. Tappets go back and forth. That pushes on the push rod which opens and closes the valves. Most engines out there, with the exception of the Lycoming 235 and the 290D, the only ones I can think of until you get into radial engines, all have hydraulic tappets. So we're using solid tappets in this engine, kind of a rare thing, but they're out there. That's the big difference. We'll talk more about that later. All right, that's a beautiful engine. <clears throat> um, and it's got a coffee pot that comes with it. So uh, I think I took this picture uh, when I went back to uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, to the Lycoming Overhaul School, which was fun. I was there several weeks. <clears throat> that is a Lycoming IO540. I can tell it's a 540 because it has six cylinders, and that's what size they made it. It has an angle valve. We'll talk about that. You can tell it's an angle valve by the shape of these rocker box covers. I can tell it's fuel injected because it's got a fuel injected uh, distributor valve up there. And well, that's what it is. I guess that's for something else I'm going to talk about. All right. Ready to write? Yeah. Remember, you don't have to. I'm not checking your notes. I don't care. I actually had somebody who was like, oh, man, you would make me write these notes. Well, I'm not making you. Like, well, you're not going to check my notebook at the end of the class? I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, Why would I do that? All right, so week one, we're going to talk about theory, operation of reciprocating engines. Uh, for the new people, don't forget, just like 309, you have Canvas quizzes. So this Friday, well, it gives me a short a day, Friday, shooting for, we're going to have a test. And... First part of the test is going to be questions I made up based upon the lecture and the reading. Second part of the test is all those Q&A questions in Canvas. Remember the Canvas Q&A questions? All right. If you've looked ahead, you're going to notice that week one, two, and three are not that bad. Week four is probably the worst week ever. There is hundreds of questions. It's all oil. It's like so much. I would not wait until week four to hit those. You might want to start mm -hmm. looking at them now. I, I thought about putting them in the other weeks, I'm like, but I just, I'm not talking about it. So what can I do? All right. So I've got your reading all set up in Canvas. Let's see. All right. So here we go. First note, basic theory. Basic theory of what? Reciprocating engines. We're going to talk about reciprocating engines for the four weeks. And then after this, you're going to talk about turbine engines with fill. So a reciprocating. What's the word reciprocating means? <coughs> Back and forth. Round and round would be radial. So recip reciprocating means it goes back and forth. What's going back and forth? 
pistons in there. So recip. From here on out, I'm just going to say recip. So I don't have to write all that. Recip. Now, save time and see world uh, is known <coughs> as a heat engine. Now, I don't call it that. Most people out in the field don't call it that, but textbook does. We'll talk about it. Well, that's a heat engine. Why? Because it utilizes heat from fuel to produce power. It uses heat from fuel to produce power. We're not going to talk about fuel in this class. We're going to hit it in, in my next one. We're going to talk a lot about fuel. All right, so it uses heat to expand gases and create <coughs> pressure on a piston in a cylinder. So inside of the cylinder, by the way, we will call this a cylinder. When it's got the valves and everything else, it'll be a cylinder assembly. If I were to take the valves out, it was just the head and the barrel. These two we don't ever take apart. They're machined and screwed together at the factory. But if it was just these two pieces with nothing else in it, we call it a stud assembly. But once we put the valves and everything in, then we call it a cylinder assembly. So, all right, so we'll call these cylinders. We will not call them heads. Because if we want to talk about the head, this is the head. This is the barrel. Together it is a cylinder. All right. So let me see. Where was I? Reciprocating. I guess I did write that. Be reciprocating. Uh, so it turns reciprocating, recip, um, back and forth. Forth. Motion into rotary motion. What's the rotary motion? Prop. Going around in circles. <coughs> we have several different types of recip engines. Several different types. And I'll cover them quickly, and then we'll go back over them a little bit slowly, I think. Several different types of recip engines. And we can define them in several different ways. Um, one of the ways we can do it is can be defined by operating principle. Can be defined by operating principle. By that I mean, how does it work? Because there's different types of engines and how they work. So we've got the good old, we can say the by strokes, we have the good old two-stroke engine. We've got a two-stroke. Nobody's got a two-stroke. Like What's that? Like yeah, the like old dirt bikes. <laughs> Sounded kind of funny. Wing, ding, 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 ding. <coughs> so a stroke, and we'll talk more about this, a stroke is when the piston travels from the bottom dead center to the top. So stroke is going from the bottom of the cylinder to the top. That's stroke. And by two stroke, what they mean is everything happens within two strokes. Well, there's not a lot of two strokes, I think, out there anymore. EPA doesn't like them. We'll talk about that later. Or we can have a four stroke, which is pretty much what everything else is. The aircraft engine we're going to be working on is a four-stroke. Your car is a four-stroke. Well, mine's not. Um, <laughs> um, and that means it takes four strokes to do all of the events to, to make it work. Um, there was the Wankel. Not the Wanker. That's different. The Wankel, which we'll talk about, which is, who knows what the Wankel is? Rotary. Rotary. Also called a rotary. Now, I want to call it a Wankel, but I can put Wankel rotary. 
Wankel Rotary. Who had the Wankel Rotary? Mazda. Mazda. I hear they're coming back with it. No, no, it's right. Nope. It's false? I don't want them to. Oh, why not? Okay. <laughs> why, do, why do you not like them? They're paying to work on. The seals didn't last very long. No. No. All right. No Wankel fans here. <laughs> um. We also have what I'm going to call the, this isn't the best way, the gnome. They're actually the one rotary. Or, I'll say, we'll call it rotary. Rotary or radial. It's actually a radial engine. And I've got some pictures of that when we get to it. But that is basically a, a radial engine is, not that. There, that's a, that's a radial engine. Radial, because it's a circle. Now, this particular type of radial engine is the common one where it's like your engine. It's these cylinders and that crankcase. They're all mounted to the aircraft, and the propeller spins around. But the gnome radial, which is sometimes called a rotary engine in aviation, is where they mount the crankshaft, the back end of the crankshaft, to the uh, airframe. And these cylinders and, and the prop basically is mounted to the case and the cylinders and the prop all move around. I'll show you a picture of that when we get to that. So that's, uh, we have that kind. And then I think I have one more. Oh, yeah. And then we could say we have the diesel. But we don't call it diesel in aviation. We call it compression ignition. But you know what happens if you call it a diesel? Everybody goes, oh, yeah, diesel. They know what you're talking about. We don't use diesel. We use Jet A. If you said it's a jet A engine, they think it's a jet engine. So you say it's a diesel slash jet A. I don't know. Um, the only company I think that's doing that is there was a company called Thielert Diesel out of Germany, and they used a Mercedes block, and they created a turbo diesel. We have one in our 172. And then they sold it to Continental. Continental bought it. But I don't think they're using it in anything. Yeah. Do you know who makes the diesel engines for Diamond Stars then? Oh, I forgot. Diamond has them. Diamond still uses them. Yeah. I don't think they're... They're common. They forgot about Diamond. Who does make those? Is it dealer or Continental Technologies maybe? I don't know. I haven't had a chance to look. Let's look that up. Let's figure that one out. Google. Not right now. Well, I'm busy, so I can't do it right now. All right. So not only could we be define it by its operating principle, and by the way, which one is the most common here? Four-stroke. Four Four-stroke, Four yeah. And even if we got into the gnome or the, the diesel or even the Wankel, we could define those by stroke as well. We could look at it and identify it as how many strokes it would take. So that's kind of mixing them up a little bit. Um, but if you think about it, you know, if you talk about like, oh, I've got a motorcycle, you know, for a dirt bike, oh, two-stroke or four-stroke. You know, that's how we're going to define the engine. Um, if you said you had a rotary, I'd be like, like the Mazda rotary or like the Gnome rotary? And like, <laughs> so one's impressive, one's like, hey. Uh, we can also, can be defined by cylinder arrangement. All right, so cylinder arrangement. We've got the uh, opposed engine. Opposed, which would be that one. Cylinders are opposing each other, kind of. If we had a, when you look, stand back and look at your engines, you'll realize the cylinders aren't across from each other. There's one, then one, then one, then one. They're staggered. And it makes sense when you look at the crankshaft why they're staggered. You couldn't have them in line, or you could be a different type of crankshaft. And we've got the radial engine, where the cylinders are arranged in a radial type. I'll write this down in a minute. We have the inline engine. I don't think this is a Ranger. Um, I forget what particular engine this is, but I'll often talk about, it might be a Ranger, it's a Fairchild. 
aircraft, I believe. Um, so Ranger made these. Um, I built I think, one or two of these in my day. They're beautiful on the inside. They look like a watch. I mean, every little part is just so gorgeous and great care and detail. Um, but they had some problems, which we'll talk about. But you'll notice there, it's a six solder and it's upside down. Hmm. Why do you suppose they made it upside down? Oil. They wanted the crankshaft higher. Get the crankshaft higher so that you have prop clearance. Hmm. Uh, we have the V-type engines which is arranged in a V. So they have two banks of cylinders, one bank here and one bank over there. And anybody guess the last one? Boxer. You. Straight. Uh, boxer would be opposed. Straight would be like the Ranger. Okay. Think Bentley. W. W. The w. The only example I could think of is this one here. So it's one, two, three, four, and they come up. Like that, so it's uh, kind of a funky W, but the W that's an Allison V3420. So, all right, we have opposed, which is what we're working on, often off, also called the boxer type, the radial. There's the radial like the gnome radial, there's the radial like the, the typical ones. Um, we have inline. We have the V type and the W. All right, so let's, oops, that's two, two, two. Theory of operation for a four stroke. All right, let's throw out some terms here. A stroke, a stroke. You guys know how to identify the signs of a stroke? Somebody should at my age, at least, you know. <laughs> a stroke is the distance a piston travels through the cylinder. What was our stroke on a 290? in inches 3.875 inches it doesn't move that far less than four inches how big around is that piston almost five inches that's a little piston for, for aviation it might be ah, good that's where we're going next all right Stroke, distance piston travels through the cylinder. 290 is just a little bit less than four inches. For each stroke, each stroke, the crankshaft, crankshaft travels 180 degrees. Yeah, 180 degrees here here full circles 360 so one half of a circle at 180 degrees the crankshaft for a four stroke then for a four stroke or for all four strokes the crankshaft travels how many degrees yep 720 degrees or one cycle. Um, when the piston is all the way up, up, or since we're talking about uh, 
horizontally opposed engine, the boxer engine, it'd be or out, all the way up, or all the way out. It is called. Yep. It is called top dead center, or TDC. You might also see um, B TDC. B stands for before or ATDC, after top dead center. Uh, let's see, so that's TDC, remember that. And then four when the piston, when piston is all the way down or in, it is called, oops, it's called bottom dead center. All right, this whole idea of bottom center, dead center, top dead center, why didn't they just say top or bottom? Well, let's take a look at an engine here. And let's see, I think I have to go here to make it work. And find my four stroke, four stroke, first one there. And I think I can make it bigger. We're gonna slow it way down. I think I can go, oops. I go frame by frame, I can. <coughs> All right, this is not a perfect animation, but it kind of works. In that if I turn this crankshaft just a tiny bit more, that piston would actually be all the way up at the top. But you can see that the connecting rod, this piece, and the crankshaft, and this is a crank throw, they wouldn't be quite an alignment. They would be just a little bit off, but the piston would still be all the way at the top. And top dead center means that everything is completely lined up. So if you think about it, the, it, it, it rose, rotates around. You have the not quite a perfect alignment, but the piston's still at the top. Then suddenly you have an absolute perfect alignment with everything. Follow? Follow. Okay. So this is, that's what the dead center means. Again, if I, if I move this crankshaft one degree to either which way, the piston wouldn't move. If it did, it'd be almost imperceivable. I mean, you'd have to use a little a tool to do that. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it move. But if it's one degree either way, it's not top dead center because that connecting rod, this thing, the connecting rod is not in perfect alignment going straight down. It's off just a little bit, one degree. So that top dead center. And the same thing with bottom, bottom dead center. And the reason why that's so important is because we have to have an absolute spot from where everything is measured from. For ignition timing, for valve timing, everything has to be an exact. You can't be um, just kind of guessing, ah, it's around there. Um, it's got to be exact. So let's talk about these four strokes. So the four, there's four strokes and five events that are going to happen. And again, this isn't perfect. So we're going to use this and then we're going to go off from here and show, well, how does it really work? So let's take a look at this just a little bit, get, kind of understand what's going on. Well, first of all, it's drawn. It's a wonderful thing. So if anybody's watching who did this, you did a fantastic job. Thank you for this. I love it. Um, but in order to get it all on a 2D model here for us, they had to leave off some stuff. So we have a crankshaft. We have a connecting rod and a piston. We have two valves. We have, I don't know which is which yet, an intake and an exhaust valve. Over here is the camshaft. The camshaft has a lobe, which will come around and push on the push rod. The push rod then takes the rocker arm and opens the valve. And there should be some springs here that pull it up. And, and again, we're going to cover all this in great detail, but I want everybody to be like, oh, these are the four strokes. In order to make this work, you'd have to have this same setup over here. They didn't draw it. And they could have. They could have drawn another cam here. That would be a dual cam. Um, a lot of cars, uh, I think most all cars now have overhead cams where they get rid of this push rod and they take this cam and they just put it up here and rotate right on the, the um valve which takes care of valve lash and stuff but anyway you have to just pretend that there's something over on the other side so there are four strokes five events four strokes we are at the top and i don't think we're where we want to be let's see let's back it up here and we always want to start there we go start on the intake and i'm going to write all this down for you 
So, so this is going to be the intake valve. This will be the exhaust valve. So intake is where you breathe it in, and the exhaust is your butt where you blow it out. So all right, so we start at the top. Top dead center intake. Piston comes down. Intake valve opens up. As the piston comes down, it draws in a fresh charge of fuel and air mixture. Sucks it in. What makes it go in is the piston coming down like a syringe, pulling it in. But it happens fast. We're going to talk about that. So it pulls it in. Pulls in this fuel-air mixture. Brings it all the way down. Fills it up best it can. And then it's going to start compressing it. And notice the minute it started compressing it, that intake valve closed. Sealed off the chamber. And now the piston is going to come up and compress all of the fuel and air. And when it gets to the top into this drawing, we see a little spark happens right there which is going to ignite the fuel-air mixture. It's very important that it burns it. It does not explode it. Exploding is very, very bad. But it ignites it. That hot gas starts expanding. As it expands, it pushes the piston down. That is the power stroke. It pushes the piston all the way down on the power stroke. And it gets to the bottom. And it must go up and expel all the burnt uh, nastiness out the exhaust valve starts the process all over again. So get a good speed going here. There we go. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Four event four four strokes. There's five events. We just have to add one thing. What do we add? Ignition. Ignition. So now we'd say the five events, intake, compression, ignition, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, ignition, power, exhaust. What we're going to, you're going to notice, I hope, as we move along, is that two things that we can talk about right here as far as what's happening up here. Number one. In this drawing, the intake valve opens perfectly as the piston starts its way down, thus making a perfect example of an intake stroke. Also, the exhaust valve opens perfectly as the piston starts to push out, which does not really happen. Those two things don't happen. The third thing that doesn't really happen is the spark does not occur when the piston is at the top. It occurs on its way up, which we're going to cover. But that is the four-stroke engine. Four strokes, five events. So B, the four strokes. All right, first stroke is? Intake. Intake. That's just because where we start. All right, piston is on. Piston starts at? Starts at TDC. That is true. On the stroke, strokes are always top dead to bottom. That doesn't change. When you define a stroke, the, regardless of where the valves are doing, the stroke starts at the top, ends at the bottom. So it starts at top dead center. Um, what are the valves doing here? Uh, intake is open. Okay, intake valve opens. Or is, oh, we'll say it's open. Um, and it ends. On bottom dead center. Bottom dead center. Next stroke is compression. compression. Starts on bottom dead. Starts on bottom dead center. Um, let's see valves. Both okay. Both valves closed. And ends on top dead center. This is a simplified version. We're going to modify this a little bit into what really happens. And then we have to unmodify it to tell you what really happens. Um, let's see. What's next? Ooh. Talk about strokes, though. But thank you. You were correct. You are definitely not wrong. Um, let's do that. 
put this right here. The ignition really happens during compression, so we're going to put that right there, ignition. Then we'll go to three. We'll say power stroke. Well, it starts on. Top dead center. Starts on top dead center. Um, valves are. Closed. In theory, they're closed. Um, ends on. Bottom, bottom. bottom dead center. Um, all right, pressure in the cylinder. is greatest just after top dead center. So the piston is going to come up. Ignition happens while it's on its way up, really. And it continues to compress. And the gases are already burning. And the piston's still coming up. And then it's going to turn around and come down. And that's when the pressure is the greatest. And that would make sense because if the piston's coming up and the pressure's the greatest, well, this is going to push back the other way. And then the engine will just kind of go backwards and then that wouldn't solve anything. Um, most gases are burned up. Burned up um, by about 14 degrees after top dead center. So the greatest pressure just after top dead center, just as it starts to come down, by about 14 degrees, everything's pretty much burned up. Doesn't mean it's not expanding, it's just gas, is, it's done burning at that point. All right, my last stroke is? Exhaust, it starts at? Starts at bottom dead center. Um, B valve. Exhaust is open. Intake closed. And ends at top dead center. All right, so that's your basic four stroke. We're going to circle back around to that. We're going to talk about what really happens because we have to have valve overlap, we have valves opening in different uh, times, and we have to figure all that out because those are all FA questions and, and stuff you'd have to figure out. But before we get to that, we're gonna take a little side break. We're gonna talk about efficiency because the reason why it does different things is because of this, which is efficiency. Efficiency. First thing we're talking about is thermal efficiency. Well. If an engine is a heat engine and its heat is derived from fuel, we need to talk about how efficient is the engine at using the heat from the fuel to make power. Any guesses? You guys already probably know. <laughs> Measuring. Just how efficient is an engine, an internal combustion engine is what we would call this because it's an internal combustion engine. What would be an external combustion engine? Bad idea. No. <laughs> no wouldn't that be like a steam train? I'm not sure if they would consider that because the firebox is so contained. Huh? It's so technically internal, isn't it? I know, it depends on how you, but that was kind of an external. Um, anyway, any guesses how efficient it is? Any gas still inside? Oh, it's so like 20 to 30 percent? <clears throat> yeah, it's really, really low. So thermal efficiency. Uh, okay, so let's see. Let's talk about heat work. Heat work can be expressed as as mm. yeah. What is it? BTU. Yeah, a British. Thermal unit or a BTU. And if you think that's just, as Phil would say, a gee whiz statement, oh, it is not. When I was a mechanic examiner, I remember this very well as being one of the oral questions that was asked of almost every applicant. What is a British thermal unit? 
in a British thermal unit. Oh, and you had to say what a British thermal unit was. It wasn't like I said it backwards and you could say, oh, that's a BTU that you just described. I would say, what is a British thermal unit? And that is the heat required, required to raise one pound of water. That's a British pound, by the way, um, of water, British water, um, one degree Fahrenheit, one degree Fahrenheit. That also equals 778 foot-pounds of work. That part you didn't have to know. All right, with me so far? Yes. Because I'm going to drag this out. And you're like, why is he doing this? All right, so British thermal unit, BTU is? Amount of heat required to raise? One pound of water. One, one pound of water, one degree. One degree centigrade or Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, okay. That's what we need. All right, point number two. One pound of, I have petroleum here. Should we say petroleum? I'll do both. P-E-T-R-O-L-E-U-M. Or we'll say Afgas. Actually, it's petroleum is the word they used that I got this from, so I'm going to say abgas now. One pound, one pound of petroleum. Well, let's kind of talk about what is one pound of petroleum, because we always think in gallons, right? Well, now we got to think in pounds. So let me just say that um, abgas weighs six pounds per gallon. Weighs six pounds per gallon. So one pound of petroleum is how many gallons? One sixth of a gallon. So one pound is one sixth of a gallon. Well, how many quarts of that? I don't know. Uh, one <laughs> gallon, one sixth of a gallon can uh, produce about 20,000 BTU. Or 15,560,000 foot-pounds of work. That is a lot of work. So do you think my little 182 out of one-sixth of a gallon, I'm going to get 15 million foot-pounds of work? That would be so nice. Be like a little rocket ship. Uh, no, we don't get that at all. Oops, that's point number two. So that's what we should get out of petroleum. It is not what we get at all. Um, back to thermal. So thermal efficiency thermal efficiency is the percent is the percent of work an engine gets for that pound of fuel. Well, what does it do with that one pound of fuel? Well, it definitely creates the, uh, in my opinion, it's 20,000 BTU, or we can look at it like that. So we're gonna say, oh, about 20 to 30% of that BTU, or that 15 million foot pounds, goes to? Power? Yep, it's <laughs> used for power power output. And we've got about another 15 to 20 percent because we're making heat, right? So where does that heat go? Well, we have heat and we're trying to extract work and work is moving the piston down. Anything other than that is a waste and 15 to 20 percent of that is lost to heat radiation so a cylinder gets hot 380 400 degrees do we want it to get hot no that's wasted heat we use what we use the fuel for we use the fuel to heat the cylinders hmm. yeah thanks but I didn't really need that um, 
five to 10% is lost to friction. In a way, if you ask me, that's kind of heat that was, uh, that was used for production of power. You had to create the power to overcome the friction, the gears meshing, the cylinder uh, piston uh, rings rubbing against the cylinder walls and stuff like that. Um, that's why I'm specific to 20 to 30 percent is power output. That's what the propeller sees. We lost five to 10 percent in friction, but it was used to make power. We just lost it there. And that leaves 40 to 45 percent is lost out the exhaust. Global warming. Hmm. All you people driving fossil fuel cars. How dare we? You flooded the earth. For those of you just joining us, the joke is I have a coal powered car. So I prefer to run my car on coal. Um, I thought you had the Honda generator. It generates your electricity, <laughs> right? The gas powered generator that generates your electricity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oops, I messed up. This was actually, that was three, that was like two, so sorry. Three, two, and this is four. Uh, oops. Four. And let me see. I'll go a little bit more. No. I'll give you a break before I throw this next one at you.